100 years before the birth of Christ, a Greek mathematician and inventor discovered a force, a force destined to change the world. Hero of Alexandria named his invention the Elopile, after Elus, Greek god of the winds. To him, this machine was no more than a childish toy, a source of entertainment. Later, he would use it to make puppets dance by themselves and temple doors open and close automatically, as if by some mystical force. Hero could not have foreseen the impact his steam force would have on world civilization. Nor could he have realized that this crude water and fire plaything was indeed mankind's first steam-powered turbine. It would take another 1,800 years for men to recognize and harness the force of steam. By the 18th century, England was propelled into a revolution, an industrial revolution. England's industrial might lay in her huge reserves of coal, black coal, for iron smelting and fuel. It was in the ever-deepening coal mines of England that the steam engine made its dramatic reappearance. 1705 saw Thomas Newcomen introduce his atmospheric steam engine to help pump out the flood of groundwater from the mines. Seventy years later, James Watt made extensive improvements to the steam engine by fitting it with a separate steam condenser. Later, he changed the reciprocating motion of steam power to a rotary motion, and the wheels of industry began to turn. With this extraordinary industrial development came another revolution. In 1829, George Stevenson, his son Robert, and their steam locomotive rocket won a race on rails. Moving at then unheard of speeds of up to 58 kilometers an hour, the Stevenson rocket returned a 500 pound purse and a contract to supply new steam locomotives for the Liverpool to Manchester railway. Through the genius of men like James Watt and George and Robert Stevenson, steam produced by burning coal had become the world's new industrial force. Even so, it remained a world lit with candles, oil lamps, and gas lights. While England was celebrating her newfound industrial wealth, on the other side of the world, in the colony of Australia, life was a little less sophisticated. Still, by the middle of the 19th century, Melbourne residents were left to gape in wonder at a new product of the scientific age, the electric light. Those who said it would never catch on were to be proved very wrong. On August the 6th, 1879, the Melbourne Cricket Ground held its first night football match under the new electric brilliance. A capacity crowd of 12,000 saw Collingwood Rifles take on the East Melbourne Volunteers, complete with white painted football. The score, three goals all, a draw. By the last decade of that century, Melbourne's electricity supply business was brisk, but hopelessly uncoordinated. Different companies were supplying different voltages and different fittings. Often changing your address meant buying a completely new set of electrical appliances. And there was one other big problem. Victoria had little of the black coal that was used to raise the steam that drove the generators, and miners' strikes made supplies from New South Wales far from reliable.
The answer lay 150 kilometers east of Melbourne in the Latrobe Valley. Their prospectors from the 1870s had found impressive reserves of brown coal. It was time for government action. In 1911, a Royal Commission recommended a single electricity authority for Melbourne. And by 1919, State Parliament passed the Electricity Commissioners Act. In their first report to Parliament, the three commissioners, headed by Sir Thomas Lyle, made a recommendation which would have an impact far greater than anyone could have dreamt. We beg to submit here with a scheme for coal mining and electrical undertaking to be undertaken in the neighbourhood of Morwell and the distribution of electricity therefrom. And with those words, the vast Latrobe Valley Power Complex was born. By 1921, the State Electricity Commission had its first full-time chairman, Sir John Monash. Monash was a famous wartime general in the Australian Army and a distinguished civil engineer. It would be his exceptional skill as a planner and administrator that would lead the fledgling SEC through the difficult years of its early development. In the Latrobe Valley, life under canvas at your lawn in those early days was hard and tough, as were many of the town residents. To local police constable Kennedy, a large physique was a distinct advantage. Work began on the new open cut with horses, picks, shovels and blisters. A shallow blanket of soil over burden was scraped away to reveal the top of a massive seam of brown coal. But it was only then that a shattering discovery was made. Plans and specifications for the new power station had been based on the assumption that the moisture content of all your lawn brown coal would be the same. Test shafts in the new open cut had shown that coal to be wetter than any discovered in the state. John McMahon, a young engineer and chemist then in his early 20s, can recall the drama in those pioneering years. Well, the problem was that uh, here we had a coal of 45% moisture, and the new open cut, the moisture content of the coal was 60%. And as a result, we only had uh, uh, a fuel that uh, was of less value than what we designed. So, with expectations high, and much of the new Yulon power station already built, the wet brown coal was a depressing discovery. Or well, more than that, it was tragic. <laughs> You've got no idea. <laughs> but plans were changed. Calculations reworked and the first SEC power station to burn the new Latrobe Valley brown coal was finally built. Yalorn A would set the pattern. Then on the 15th of June, 1924, a milestone. For the first time, power from the Latrobe Valley flowed along the new 132,000 volt transmission line to supply the people of Melbourne. Also in that year, another first. The Yalorn Briquette Factory, the first large-scale briquetting works outside Europe, started hammering out a new source of heat for homes and factories. Things had become easier in the open cut, too. A large steam shovel was winning the brown coal once dug by hand. Yalorn Township had changed its face. Its tenth town image had given way to the curb and channeling of suburbia. By 1928, the SEC was supplying nearly all the electricity requirements of Melbourne and over 100 country centres across Victoria. In that year, with all six units at Yalorn A power station working, 
the SEC made its first profit, as Sir John Monash had promised it would. Monash remained as chairman of the SEC for 11 years until his death in 1931. Through his military and engineering genius, he had become a hero to his own generation. Later in the 1930s, the SEC was dealt another blow. Just as it was recovering financially from the effects of the Great Depression, Yalorn was devastated by floodwaters. On that wet November day in 1934, levee banks to protect the open cut against floodwaters were almost useless. A swirling torrent broke through and filled the open cut at the rate of 23 million litres per minute. The Great Flood cost the SEC dearly. Nearly half a million dollars, a fortune in those days, was spent repairing the damage. But it was the war years which taxed the SEC's ability to cope most heavily. The demand for men, supplies, food and electricity rose dramatically. And the drama was not restricted to the war front. The summer of 1944 will surely be remembered as one of the harshest on record. In Victoria's rich Latrobe Valley, disaster strikes. The temperature had hit 99 degrees and a searing north wind was blowing. Almost unbelievably, a local farmer lit a small fire to burn off scrub. The result? A raging bushfire. By the end of that tragic day, the inferno had taken nine lives, destroyed 116 homes, and left the huge Yalorn brown coal open cut crippled. Yet just 11 days after the fire, the SEC had licked its wounds, and Victoria's electricity supplies were once again back to normal. B-Day was August the 15th, 1945. It was the end of the war, and the nation heaved a sigh of relief. By now, your lawn stations A and B were operating in the valley. The new Kiwa hydroelectric scheme had come online and stations at Ballarat, Geelong and Newport B were all operating to capacity. Still, there was an urgent need to expand the SEC's generation capability. Another open cut, a second brown coal power station and an even larger briquette factory. More was an ambitious plan, and one which was to be plagued by post-war shortages of men, supplies, and money. Progress was steady, but slow. In 1954, some very special visitors to the valley, a young Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, saw for themselves the newest addition to the Yalorn complex, Yalorn Sea. It didn't stop there. By the time Yalorn D and E were complete, the station would have a capacity eight times that of the original A station. The Morwell complex started producing power and briquettes by the end of the 1950s. And with this development came even larger coal winning machines. In the 1920s, Monash said, demand for electricity never falls off. It always grows. He was right. Despite the economic recession of the early 60s, a new electricity connection to a Victorian country town was almost a weekly celebration. During the 1960s, the SEC's capital expenditure bill rose by 80%, but with good reason. In those years, the SEC brought into service eight new 200 megawatt turbo generating units at the rate of one unit a year. And all under a single roof over half a kilometer long. This was the decade of the massive Hazelwood power station. In one mighty stroke, Hazelwood had nearly doubled the SEC's Latrobe Valley power capacity.
that had taken the previous 40 years to build. More giant power stations with even larger generators were to follow. A far cry from Hero and his spinning, spluttering steam engine. Somebody once said, everything changes and everything remains the same. Nature's force of steam on which the 20th century depends is the same force which fascinated that old man and amused his friends nearly 2,000 years ago. Hero fueled his turbine with a wood fire. Today in the Latrobe Valley, the heat source is brown coal. But the principle remains the same. Taken from vast open cuts, the coal is pulverized and dried in special mills. Then mixed with air and blown into a very large furnace. Inside the furnace, a maze of tubes carry water to be heated and turned into steam. The principle is long established. Stevenson's rocket pioneered this multiple tube idea to win that great race. Superheated steam at great pressure is then piped into a steam turbine. The steam expands and the turbine spins. With its energy spent, the steam is recycled, converted back to water in the mass of pipes which make up the steam condensers. Again, a principle developed and proven by James Watt two centuries ago. This condensate water is then ready to be recharged with energy and again turned into steam. The electrical heart of any power station is the generator, a machine to harness the power of the spinning turbine. Modern generators produce high voltage alternating current. But to allow it to be transmitted over long distances, the electricity must be transformed to higher voltages. Practically man-made lightning. In Victoria today, electricity is transmitted over hundreds of kilometers at up to half a million volts. By design, a modern thermal power station must be responsible in its use of natural resources. At the Yalorn W power station, built in the 1970s and early 80s, warm water from the steam condensers is cooled in these giant towers. They work something like a large car radiator. Water vapor and warmed air rise from the top. Cooled water collects in a pool at the base, ready for reuse. While at Hazelwood, the water is cooled during a two-week-long circulation around a man-made lake. Water to cool a power station. Warmth to take the shiver out of all season sailing. And a place to call home during the cold Victorian winter. But then the Latrobe Valley and its environment for man and beast has always been given high priority by the SEC. When a mountain of wet brown coal is burned every day in this valley, pollution control becomes essential. A key element in this control are these expensive and elaborate exhaust filters called electrostatic precipitators. As the exhaust gases leave the furnace, they pass over a series of electrically charged metal plates. The dust is attracted to the collection plates, allowing the cleaned gas to escape through the chimney. And to check that performance, a multi-million dollar air quality study. The most sophisticated of its type in Australia. 
This airshed study is a joint project by the SEC, Environment Protection Authority, the La Trobe Valley Water and Sewerage Board, and the CSIRO. Delicate instruments are used to electronically sniff the air and radio their findings back to Earth. A network of ground monitoring stations and weather towers to retrieve a mass of information. These acoustic horns constantly probing the atmosphere with sound waves. And at the heart of the operation, a silicon brain. A central computer to give meaning and significance to endless figures and computations. Those who run this study say the gaseous pollutants in Latrobe Valley air are in nearly all cases well below half their acceptable levels. But the work will go on. Work towards the successful coexistence of power stations and people in a delicate environment. Today, brown coal burnt in this valley produces about 75% of Victoria's annual electricity needs. Electricity to meet Victoria's constant demand, day and night. The peaks in demand are met as they occur by power from stations which can react more quickly. Hydroelectric stations like those at Kiva and Dartmouth in the northeast high country. And natural gas-fired stations like Newport near Melbourne. And Gerolang in the Latrobe Valley. Meeting today's demand for electricity is a minute-by-minute decision-making process. Most of those decisions are made in this room. The SEC's System Control Center. What power is needed, what power stations to use to meet the load. It's all a matter of numbers and facts. But there are no facts about the future. Load forecasting is the art of looking ahead 10 to 15 years to the power needs of tomorrow's society. In 1974, SEC forecasters had done their sums. They knew that by the mid-1980s, a new Latrobe Valley power station would be needed. A station on a scale of size and performance never before attempted. In 1977, work started in this paddock towards the birth of the Loi Yang power station, the giant of them all. Loi Yang is divided into two stages, Loi Yang A and B, each of four 500 megawatt generating units. The eight units will be brought on stream progressively as they are needed, through to the 1990s. Loi Yang has brought a new dimension to brown coal power generation in the Latrobe Valley. It physically dwarfs all existing thermal power stations and represents state-of-the-art technology in a world of computers and the silicon chip. And to feed this giant, a new breed of bucket wheel dredger. Number 14 is as long as the Melbourne cricket ground and can gouge out nearly 60,000 tons of coal in a day. Little wonder they call it Australia's biggest shovel. Well, we had no idea in 1921 that this would be developed like this. So extensive, you know, compared with the alert. I almost feel as though I can't comprehend the size of it. Uh, it's almost beyond comprehension. It's too big for me. <laughs> Just too big. In a way, the power stations in this Latrobe Valley 
former chronicle of engineering advances in over six decades of thermal power generation.